Harry Baldock here, editor for Total Telecom. Delighted to be joined by Chris Sambar, the president of AT&T Network. Uh, Chris, how's the conference going for you so far? So far it's going great, Harry. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. It's, it's really great to have you. And I, I know you've just come off a, a really exciting uh, keynote panel this morning, quite, quite fiery, which is uh, what we love to see. Um, and it's talking about the state of kind of 5G and fiber and connectivity more broadly in the, uh, the US. Uh, I wondered what you maybe thought of as the kind of key takeaways from that session this morning. I think it was a lively session, Elad and I from uh, the head of Comcast over there. We, we had some lively back and forth, obviously some great competition in the US when it comes to broadband. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway from my talk was you know, AT&T wants the biggest, be the biggest, the best, and the most reliable network in America. And that's a combination of the broadband network, but a combination of wireless and fiber. And you know, we can get into um, how those two interact with each other, but we're really excited about our incredible growth that we've seen over the years, and that's just nothing but continuing to go on. Yeah, exciting times. I, I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the kind of evolution of 5G in America. I know it's been a, a maybe maybe even four years, I think, since uh, the advent of 5G in, uh, in the US. Do you think it's kind of living up to its potential at the moment? So 5G is the fastest growing wireless technology. It's also the most connected with fiber compared to any other older technology. And I, I, I get this question a lot and I always liken it to LTE. You know, in the early days of LTE, um, we got really great speeds on the network and people said, well, what are we going to do with all this speed? This is amazing, but what do we do with it? And then as time progressed with LTE, the ecosystem developed, because it's really an ecosystem. It's not just up to the telcos, it's not just up to the content providers, the infrastructure providers. Everyone has to work together. And what we saw with LTE is, you know, ride sharing apps are ubiquitous now. Everyone uses Uber and Lyft and others like those. Um, you can watch a video anywhere you want, anytime you want, on any of your mobile devices, and you don't even think twice about it. Just five years ago, it really didn't work that way. You'd have, you know, you'd have stuttering on the video, you'd have some jitter and latency issues, but now everything works great. So LTE showed us what's possible when the ecosystem develops together. Um, 5G is going to be very similar. Um, 5G is moving, it's taking its time, but it's also more complex than LTE was. Um, building out the mid-band spectrum, the millimeter wave spectrum, getting from the radio access network all the way into the core of the network, architected to be able to provide really high speeds, really low latency, incredible jitter, um, and then all of the ecosystem players, the content providers, pushing the content closer to the edge to improve the latency, making sure that the infrastructure of the network can support that latency. Um, all of those things have to come together, and they are. We're seeing them slowly come together, and we're seeing experiences get better and better. So I think we're getting there. It's just going to take a little time. Absolutely, and, and speaking of kind of 5G evolution, I wanted to ask you a quick question about uh, standalone 5G, which I know at and is already rolling out in the core. Firstly, how's that going? And, and secondly, how's that going to uh, impact the customer's experience? I've, I've explained to my, uh, I have some teenagers in the house, and I've explained to them, you know, at a high level what standalone 5G means, um, what low latency is, why they care about jitter when they're playing their video games, because they like to play those first person um, shooter video games. And um, we're making progress on the standalone core, uh, you know, getting the contiguous polygons in a city where you have good mid band spectrum, a good radio access network experience. You have a standalone core built on cloud native hardware um, that you can move workloads around, you can instantiate new. Uh, services onto those virtual machines. All of that's going to work in concert to be able to provide us a robust experience and the standalone core is at the center of it all. And so we're seeing a lot of great progress around the world with operators. Um, we have rolled out our standalone core at AT&T. We're scaling that core. We're starting to put some of these newer services on there. Gaming, augmented reality, virtual reality. We're pretty excited about the monetization opportunities with those new services. And it, like I said, it's just continuing to come together with the standalone core and all of this new great mid-band spectrum that we've got. And one of the 5G topics that's uh, growing in popularity in the US, and it, it came up on the keynote uh, this morning, was uh, uh, fixed wireless access, which obviously is uh, yeah, a very exciting prospect here in the US. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, AT&T's view on uh, FWA. Absolutely. Uh, our view is a little bit different than the other two operators in the US. You know, we see the radio access network, so we call it the air interface. That's the point of congestion. Uh, the, the, the spectrum out there, it's just a, a simple physics equation. How much uh, load or bandwidth can that spectrum provide to the users? And those fixed wireless users, one of our um, peers in the industry quoted that they're seeing up to a half a terabit a month of usage on their fixed wireless network. 
That's a lot. That's a lot of bandwidth to put on a wireless network on and really congest the air interface very quickly. So you've got a couple of problems with that. One, in any given wireless sector, you can only accommodate a certain number of customers before you have to close that sector down. So it's not a true broadband replacement because you're going to leave a lot of people unserved, unfortunately. Um, the second problem is, as time goes on, people's bandwidth needs, they're never satiated. They always want more, and it's just continuing to grow. On our fiber network, we, we have average usage up, up at a terabit. And so um, people are going to want to consume more on this radio access network, on this fixed wireless product, and we're going to come to a time where we're going to have a hard time providing that if we deploy it too broadly. And I think that's what the other two operators in the U.S. are going to struggle with too broad a deployment, they're going to run into real challenges, and the only way to fix those challenges is to deploy a lot more infrastructure, which becomes very expensive. And when we look at the math of providing those services, the growth projected, um, and then deploying more infrastructure to try and keep up with that growth, it doesn't, doesn't pretend for a very good value proposition. We think that fiber, you know, a, a solid broadband product, a fiber strand you can put in the ground and serve a household for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, by just changing the optics on the endpoints, you can get faster speeds. We think that's a really durable, long-term solution for customers. So that's really where our focus is. That said, we will be rolling out fixed wireless. Um, our main use case that we're going after is on our legacy network, our copper network, where we have broadband subscribers who have fairly low speeds. Fixed wireless is a step up in speed for them. And the secondary benefit is if we get them off of the copper services over to the fixed wireless services, that allows us to shut down that older copper network, which is, you know, it's using a lot of energy in the network. And so we'd really like to shut that down sooner than later. So fixed wireless has a place. We just look at it as more of a niche solution versus a broad broadband solution. Complementary rather than competitive in fiber. You got it, exactly. Great way to say it. The last question for you, I think, is another really big topic here at uh, Connected America is about sustainability. And I know AT&T's got plans to be carbon neutral by 2035. I wonder maybe what you could talk to us about in terms of the uh, the evolution of the network to before, towards becoming more sustainable. You mentioned that obviously uh, 5G and fiber are going to be uh, less energy hungry, I guess, than, uh, than the legacy technologies. So what does that transformation look like? Yeah, some of those older technologies, especially the old copper network, um, the infrastructure, the equipment that that copper is riding on is really energy inefficient. And so, you know, we've got a couple of motivations here. First and foremost, we all live on this planet, so we want to take care of the planet. <clears throat> so the more we can conserve and um, be good stewards of the environment, the, the better off I think we all are. The second side of that is that there's an economic benefit. AT&T's power bill, it's well over a billion dollars. And um, we'd obviously like to lower that. The faster I can get consumers off of the copper network, the faster I can shut down the infrastructure in the offices where that copper network is running, and um, that saves me a whole lot of money. Our, our power bill, year over year, even with energy rates going up, our consumption is going down year after year because the new services operate on much more efficient hardware, silicon chips are much more efficient, and we're shutting down the old network. So it's been interesting to watch the power consumption actually go down as time goes on. Other things I would say which uh, help us get on our way to this carbon neutral footprint is artificial intelligence, advanced machine learning. You know, we've announced partnership with companies like NVIDIA where we're able to do a lot better job of optimizing our technician truck roles. Just when I send a technician to someone's house to do a repair, making sure that I really needed to send a technician versus could I ship something in the mail or could I just do something in the network itself and fix their problem. Um, and the other one, and this one, I think this one's kind of my favorite because I think the opportunity is huge here. And uh, we're really going after this one hard right now. On our wireless network, we've got, you know, 70, 80,000 plus nodes out in the network, a lot of them. And we have looked at how many times we visit those cell sites on average in a year. It's a pretty big number. It's bigger than it needs to be. And so if I can get a machine to help me, so I'll give you an example. There was a... There was a cell site in southern Oklahoma, and it had a radio. There was a bad jumper um, into the radio, and so that sector was shut down. While it was awaiting getting repaired, they had replaced the jumper. On that same cell site, if a machine could look at it and say, okay, the customer experience on that cell site isn't degraded, even though I've had to shut down a radio, and there is a HVAC maintenance job coming up that's due in two months, and we're going to upspeed that from one gig to 10 gig. And that was due in three or four months. 
if a machine can look at those three things that are all scheduled for that tower in year and say, instead of just doing them one at a time and having three technician visits and burning all of that fuel, how about if I combine all those? I'll wait a month to do it so that I can combine all three of those into one visit. Um, it sounds like a simple thing, but a human has a really hard time doing that with tens of thousands of towers and maintenance jobs and repair visits, et cetera. But a machine can really help us put all that together, do the correlation analysis, and figure out when are we going to go visit that tower in the most optimal way. It's going to save us a lot of money, but it's also going to help with our carbon footprint. And that's good for the environment, and we like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's really fascinating how it's not just the technology that's becoming more uh, energy efficient, but it's also the, the logistics and the way people are using that technology absolutely. to facilitate everything. Absolutely. So, Chris, thank, thank you so much for speaking to me. It's uh, great to have you here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the My conference. Pleasure. Thanks, Harry. I appreciate it. Have a great day.